Lakeland Public Television, the Bemidji Pioneer, the Brainerd Dispatch, and KAXE Northern Community Radio are proud to present Debate Night 2014 a look at our area legislative candidates. And now, the State House of Representatives District 2A debate. Your moderator tonight is Warren Larson. Good evening and welcome to Debate 2014, six state legislative debates over four nights. Uh, we're here at the Lakeland Public Television Studio in Bemidji, Minnesota. Our candidates for tonight's debate are Dave Hancock, the Republican candidate, and Roger Erickson, the Democratic candidate. Our panel for uh, tonight's debate are Dennis Wyman, Lakeland Public Television News Director, Zach Kaiser, uh, Kaiser from Bemidji Pioneer Reporter, Scott Hall, Public Affairs Director for Northern Community Radio, KAXE and KBXE. Um, our rules for tonight's debate, uh, each candidate will be given three minutes for opening comments. Our panel will ask questions after opening comments. Some will be their own questions, others may be from the public. The candidates will rotate the order they speak beginning with opening comments and finishing with closing comments. Each candidate gets two minutes to answer the question. Each candidate will have a one minute rebuttal opportunity. Questions continue until we are about 50 minutes into debate when we move on to closing comments. Closing comments will be two minutes for each candidate. So let's begin with our opening comments. And our first candidate's opening comments tonight is Dave Hancock. Thank you, Warren, and thank you, panel, and thank you, KWE, for this opportunity to address the public. Pat, my wife and I came here 41 years ago from Colorado. I had taught school for a couple years uh, surrounding a military stint at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Uh, my wife is a registered nurse. And we came to Minnesota for opportunity, opportunity to rear a family, uh, to work in our professions, and to enjoy uh, life in the great Midwest. Uh, we almost immediately fell in love with the lakes, the rivers, the woods, the people, and almost winter. Uh, it still, to me, is a little bit too long, but it's... Uh, uh, we love our life here in Minnesota. Unfortunately, I think over the last few years, two years particularly, um, I think that opportunity is waning for citizens of Minnesota. You know, over the last 25 years, government spending in the state of Minnesota has doubled the rate of economic growth. In the last two years themselves, that rate is three times the spending rate of economic growth. Uh, that is non-sustainable. The opportunity that uh, we have had even now is less than it was when we came here. Uh, I ask the people often as I'm out walking and knocking doors, uh, really, who's in charge? Is it you or is the government? Who's making the decisions on your health care? Who's making the decisions on your child's education? Are your Second Amendment rights and your personal liberties, are they in jeopardy? And quite frankly, I think people are expressing the view that indeed they are losing control. Uh, I think we are not beyond hope. I think, but if we are not careful, the economic path that we are on of increasing taxes, increasing spending, and increasing regulations on our free market system uh, is non-sustainable and will result and us not being able to attract the businesses that we need to flourish. Uh, I think we can make a change. I think we need to get back to limited government. I think we need to make sure that government does what it is intended to do, which is secure personal liberty. And I think also that uh, the uh, free market must be restored. Government is too involved in the finances, the uh, resources, the energy, and in the day-to-day -day operations of business. All right, thank you, Mr. Hancock. Uh, Roger Erickson, opening comments. Um, thank you, Warren. Thank you, panel. Thank you, Lakeland News, uh, for this opportunity to, to speak directly to the people. Um, I'm a retired elementary school teacher from Bedette up in Lake of the Woods County. I uh, grew up in Roseau. Um, 
20 years before you came here, Dave, I was uh, living up in northern Minnesota going to college. Uh, I spent my whole life, my whole uh, uh, life basically has been spent within 10 miles of the Canadian border. Uh, when, when I ran two years ago, uh, my motivation was um, I would never vote to shut the government down and I wanted to pay back our schools. That was the big motivator for me. That was a, a factor in my uh, uh, running. Um, when we talk about we the people, uh, the people of the state of Minnesota elected us. We told them exactly what we were going to do. Uh, we set out and we did what we were going to do. We paid the schools back. Um, not only that, but we funded all day, every day kindergarten. We uh, put money on the formula. We finally um, froze college tuition for the first time in a decade or so. Um, we did what we said we were going to do, and we, the people, elected us. Um, now we have another choice. Do we want to uh, go back to 2012 with a government shutdown and uh, the massive debt that we had, or do we want to move forward? And, and uh, I'm looking forward to the, the debate, and uh, thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Our first question tonight will come from our uh, panelist, Scott Hall. Thank you, Warren. Um, Enridge Energy is proposing to build another oil pipeline across six northern Minnesota counties, including Clearwater and Hubbard counties. And the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission recently decided to look at uh, six routes in addition to the one that Enbridge is proposing. Um, and what do you think of the Enbridge route, first of all, and the benefits and risks of building another pipeline across northern Minnesota? Okay. Th thanks, Scott. Uh, that question goes to Mr. Erickson. Um, th thank you, Scott, for that question. Um, the Enbridge pipeline um, was proposed to go through the western side of Hubbard and then across the southern part of Hubbard County uh, along the route where there are many um, other pipelines going. Uh, a citizens group got together and went and started lobbying uh, and state agencies such as the Minnesota Pollution or the MPCA and the DNR um, started weighing in that maybe this wasn't the best route and the Public Utilities Commission has agreed to take a look at the other ones. Uh, I'm comfortable that the process is moving forward uh, as it should and I think uh, where the pipeline gets built will ultimately become um, part of those, uh, uh, the scientists on both sides um, coming up with a suitable answer. All right, thank you, Mr. Erickson. Mr. Hancock. We definitely need to uh, pipe the oil. Uh, I think the Enbridge pipeline um, is, it has been studied. I'm not so sure that the uh, alternative routes uh, are nothing more than really a delay tactic that, with the purpose of ultimately uh, uh, destroying or delaying the implementation of the pipeline. Uh, to me, there is no doubt that uh, the pipeline is the safest way to transport oil, be it the Keystone, the Sandpiper, Enbridge. Uh, we need to get on with that. Uh, we need to free up our rails for uh, hauling other commodities. I think the science is there. We've done the studies. Uh, we can run the pipeline uh, and protect our water, and we must get on with it now and uh, move our economy forward. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. Mr. Erickson, a rebuttal? Um, in my discussions with friends in the headwater, um, none of them has ever said that there should not be a pipeline. Um, they are all for the pipeline. They just feel that there's a better place to, uh, to put the pipeline. Um, I'm tending to lean towards that, um, especially because uh, there's a second one and possibly a third one that's in the planning stages. All right. Uh, thank you. Mr. Hancock, a rebuttal? Um, we are using pipelines now, and uh, they are the safest way to transport oil. Uh, we do need to replace them uh, as they're aging, uh, but I think the technology is there now. Uh, obviously, Minnesota is full of uh, water and wetlands and we're going to have to put the pipeline someplace. Um, you know, everybody wants it, but they don't want it in their own backyard. But I think we have to uh, say what's best for Minnesota, and let's get on and, uh, and build the pipeline. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. Uh, next question is to uh, Dennis Wyman. 
Thanks, Juan. Thank you both for being here today to debate. Do you feel roads, bridges, and highways in greater Minnesota are being properly funded by the state? And if not, what can be done to address that? All right. Thank you, Dennis. That question goes to Mr. Hancock. Uh, obviously not. You know, if, if in our bonding bill we spend $90 million on a new legislative office building and less than that for roads and bridges, I think we have our priorities uh, mixed up. Um, roads and bridges uh, are part of what I would say are the basic infrastructure needs of uh, a society in greater Minnesota. Uh, we need to build infrastructure, you know, our, our sewers and our uh, public safety. Uh, those are the things that normally we use bonding money for, but I'm not so sure that if we have surpluses, uh, we ought not to use them as, as one-time expenditures for bridge and bridges and roads. Uh, perhaps we ought to set a certain percentage of the uh, bonding money specifically uh, for that. Uh, I'm certainly not in favor of increasing the gasoline tax. Uh, to do that, I think we need to better make use of the funds that we're having. Uh, like I said, let's not spend it on uh, light rail projects and bail out uh, transit in Minneapolis, St. Paul, when we should be building ridges, bridges and uh, roads in uh, greater Minnesota. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. Mr. Erickson. Um, I truly believe that uh, transportation will be a large focus of uh, the next session down in the Capitol. Uh, and, and yes, we have real issues in outstate Minnesota, but I've also, I've also driven on some of those roads uh, down in the cities, and, and uh, I don't think a county commissioner around here would keep his job very long if they allowed the roads to get to some of the conditions of, uh, uh, of some of the roads that I've driven on down there. Um, yeah, we have some huge issues, and um, I, I'm not sure where the funding is going to come from. A gas tax may be part of it, um, but uh, we're talking five or six billion dollars just to maintain the infrastructure that we have right now. Uh, the bonding is not going to cover that. Um, there's, um, there, there's no sense that I have that, you know, the available money, even if it's one time, um, half a billion dollars or something. Um, is not going to is not going to get anywhere near where we need to get with this. All right. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Uh, Mr. Hancock, a rebuttal. I, th I think there are uh, many areas within the DOT budget and other agencies involved where we can uh, more efficiently use our funds. Uh, I just uh, you know I look up and down the roads and I see uh, one hundred thirty thousand dollar or more. Uh, John Deere equipment uh, to mow along the, the sides and it seems like we're uh, you know we're replacing our uh, fleets about every 60,000 miles when uh, today's uh, uh, economy vehicles uh, will travel uh, through three or four times that so I think we need more efficiency in how we operate before we start looking at always increasing funds finding more money taxing more uh, let's be efficient with what we have Thank you, Mr. Hancock. Mr. Erickson, a rebuttal? I think it was a few years ago that um, MnDOT was ordered to sell all their roadside mowing and, and lease these vehicles. Um, and so, you know, in a, what seemed like a good idea at the time has turned out to be probably not the best way to go about doing it. Um, but we're talking about such a huge issue that um, I, I really think that there's got to be there, there's got to be a sustainable source of funding that comes in, and whatever form that takes, um, we we really need to do something with that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Erickson. Our next question comes from Zach Kaiser. Thank you, Warren. Um, continuing on the issue of budgeting, um, was it right for the state to subsidize the new Minnesota Vikings stadium? Why or why not? All right. Thank you, Zach. Uh, that question goes to Mr. Erickson. Well, I was not in the legislature at the time that that was voted on. Uh, it, I, as a Vikings fan, as a sports fan, I coached football for 27, 8 years up in Lake of the Woods County. Uh, I enjoy watching the Vikings. Well, not always so much now, but um, I enjoy watching the Vikings. I have um, gotten away from that. Um, but do we want did we want to lose them? And I really think that was part of the situation that this was going to be built or they were going to go. Um, and, there's a, and there's a real healthy debate that could be uh, tacked onto that. 
Uh, the fact is that it was voted to build it. It's being built. Uh, we're moving on. Okay, thank you, Mr. Erickson. Mr. Hancock? I was in the legislature when it was debated. In fact, we were on the government uh, ops committee that uh, first thought we had uh, uh, defeated that. Uh, I voted no on the proposal. I would have voted for the uh, Arden Hill site, uh, thinking we could have negotiated that from the feds, probably at no charge for the cost of cleaning it up. We could have built infrastructure up there to 200 acres, which we could have done with some bonding bill. And then we could have told uh, Ziggy to build a $900 million stadium and develop the other 200 acres uh, for profit for not only himself, but for uh, the greater Minneapolis area. Uh, that would have worked. But to try to fund it with uh, pull tabs, which we saw was totally inadequate. Now to try to fund it with the cigarette tax, uh, it's totally inadequate. It's gonna come out of the general fund budget. And uh, to me, uh, I don't like the idea of, of subsidizing uh, billionaires to who play, uh, pay millionaires to play. Uh, it's just, we have more pressing needs uh, here in greater Minnesota. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hancock. Mr. Erickson, rebuttal. Again, I was not in the legislature when this was voted on. Um, we haven't had many hearings on how much more money has to be spent to take care of the state's share. Uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hancock, rebuttal? I know. All right, let's move on to our next question and that would come from Scott Hall. All right, Warren, thanks. Um, another question on the Enbridge pipeline. Um, specifically, uh, how will state or county or local government and some private landowners um, benefit from the pipeline and not just the construction, but in the long term after it's built? Okay, thank you, Scott. And that question goes to Mr. Hancock. Could you repeat the question? I wasn't sure how yeah. it will benefit. Yeah, how will local government, counties, and uh, individual landowners, private landowners benefit in the long term from the pipeline? Uh, the, the, the pipeline is basically going to transport oil uh, more efficiently, more effectively. Uh, that will free up rail to uh, ship commodities, other goods, and drive the cost of transportation basically down. Uh, I'm not in favor of uh, uh, eminent domain to create uh, more uh, uh, line for the pipeline if possible. I think we should use existing uh, uh, lines where they're at. It would be much easier to uh, be there for maintenance. It would also, uh, I think, we, where we can use government land uh, would be appropriate. Uh, the last thing we should do is, to me, take more private land uh, out of production uh, for the pipeline. Um, and I think uh, all that would benefit both local governments and uh, the landowners. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hancock. Mr. Erickson. Um, it's my understanding that um, when we're going through this process, they're signing leases and so I'm assuming that there's a monetary reward for signing the lease uh, for the pipeline going through. I don't think they can just take the existing right away and, and just run another pipeline down without uh, consent or whatever of the, of the people that own it. Um, I, again, I, I would agree with Representative, former Representative Hancock that a pipeline is the way to go and I don't think anybody's arguing that and I think our technology is, is such but um, if that, but that's up to the state agencies, public utilities commissions, uh, the MPCA, the DNR. Um, they have all their scientists on board with that. Uh, they're going to they're going to look through this and all parts of it, and uh, they'll come up with the best route that uh, the pipeline is going to take. All right. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Mr. Hancock, rebuttal. Oh, I think one other benefit that that will come from that are simply jobs. Uh, it's going to create uh, more jobs for the area. Yeah, which will boost the economy in general and uh, help everybody in terms of uh, help the state in terms of creating more tax potential. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Erickson, rebuttal? Yeah, there'll be an awful lot of good union jobs created when the pipe fitters and the welders and stuff go to work on that. Um, I'm all for that. I think everybody is. Um, and we'll let the state agencies pick the best route. All right, thank you. 
Um, our next question would come from Dennis Wyman. Do you feel the current K through 12 education formula is fair to greater Minnesota? And if not, what can be done to change it? There's obviously a lot more lawmakers in the metro area than there are outstate greater Minnesota. How, what's, what's the answer here? Well, thanks, Dennis. And that question goes to Mr. Erickson. Um, one of the things that we had um, for the Education Finance Committee chair was Paul Marquardt. And he did a really outstanding job of cutting the inequity between um, metro and outstate. I think we cut it by a third of the difference. And, um, you know, again, they have their problems out there. We have ours. I know that uh, in speaking with uh, the Bemidji superintendent and the area that he has to bus from, um, they're, they're, they're subsidizing their transportation um, budget um, from their general fund and other places um, are using a surplus in their transportation because they have the same amount of students. Um, and I think that's, a, that's an inequity that we need to deal with. Uh, we do have different issues in outstate Minnesota than they have uh, in the metro area, but um, overall I think, we should, I think we should get closer to that um, equal funding. Okay, thank you Mr. Erickson. Mr. Hancock. We cannot continue to finance Minneapolis Twin City Schools at about $14,000 and Greater Minnesota Schools at about $10,000. That third again as much money has been there for some time. It still exists there. I do want to correct a couple things when we were talking about uh, paying back the school shift, etc. cetera. Um, the budget from our legislative session increased funding to K-12 education by over $400 million. The surplus from our budget paid back both the Republican and the Democratic school shifts. If you doubt that to be true, House File 1 from this current legislature was to pay back the school shift. It got one committee hearing. Uh, the reason? The shift had already been paid back by the surplus from us. Uh, do we need to fund education differently? Yes. Uh, certainly the state, I think we rank seventh in the nation in the percentage of money that comes from the state uh, to the local schools. Uh, that's significant. Uh, about 42% of our uh, general fund budget goes to K-12 education. That is significant. From 2003 to the current time, according to the Consumer Price Index, our funding of K-12 schools has kept pace with inflation. Uh, I think funding is uh, important. We need to equalize it, uh, but I think it's adequate. Uh, our schools have other problems uh, other than funding, and hopefully we'll get a chance to address some of those this evening. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. Mr. Erickson, rebuttal? Well, I, I, two years ago when I first started running, um, the thing that came out was that we had a balanced budget. Nobody believed that then. I don't think anybody's buying the fact that that budget set up our surplus that we're doing now. Um, we raised the revenues that were necessary to pay off the $600 million uh, debt of the state and the $800 million that we owed the schools. Um, that, that's just what we did. And we, we said we were going to do it, and we went down and we did it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Mr. Hancock, rebuttal? Um, you can believe the Office of Budget and Management, we had the surplus. It was almost $3 billion. It was a $6 billion deficit when we went in. We cut increased spending by $4 billion, and revenues exceeded the budget to the tune that it paid back the checking and savings accounts of the state, and then it paid back the school shift. That's what it had to do by law. That's what it did. It left approximately $250 million uh, for the current uh, budget process to take place. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. Our next question comes from uh, Zach Kaiser. Thank you, Warren. Uh, this is... Um, a social issues question. Um, should the Minnesota State High School League rules be amended to say transgender high school students are allowed to choose whether they play on the boys or girls team in a particular, particular sport? All right. Thank you, Zach. That question goes to Mr. Hancock. Gender is biological. It's genetic. Do we need sympathy for the individual that believes he or she is really of the opposite gender? Absolutely. We need to get them some help. We need to uh, 
uh, provide them with the uh, care that they need. But to inject that into our schools in terms of a curriculum, in terms of a uh, requirement for athletic participation, uh, the fact that the Minnesota State High School League would even consider this uh, means that it looks to me like we need to take a serious look at just who is controlling our schools. Uh, I understand that it's been tabled until December, um, but this is the latest in what I would call um, an agenda that is, is creeping into our schools. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hancock. Mr. Erickson. Um, when I read that, I was, I'm very uncomfortable with this. Um, I don't know of how many other states are doing it. Um, are they having success with it? What are the parameters of it? Um, the idea of um, locker room facilities and, and where they're going to go with that, um, those things really need to be discussed and discussed at length. Uh, I'm again, I'm, I'm with Dave here that I, I was very surprised that the State High School League came up with this. Uh, it certainly never went through any of the committees that I was aware of uh, in the last two sessions. Okay, thank you Mr. Erickson. Mr. Hancock, a rebuttal? I, I think it's a continuation of, uh, it's the same groups that are pushing the anti-bullying bill. Uh, the anti-bullying bill, in my estimation, has been um, coerced upon the districts with the idea that it is going to protect students from bullying. It's going to do none of this, that issue. What it's really doing is saying that students and even the community should affirm and celebrate the idea that any sexual behavior is normal and any opposition to that view will be reviewed as uh, being a um, violation of, of the bullying policy. To me it, it goes against freedom of speech, it goes against freedom of religion, but it's a continuation of a policy uh, that is going into our schools. Okay, Mr. Erickson, uh, rebuttal. Um, I had a letter, still have it down in my office down the cities from, um, from the Bemidji superintendent and stating that, thank you for the bullying bill. We finally now have some clarification. What is bullying? It's now a definition that's in law. Um, to, to come up with excuses for bullying, whether it's uh, some agenda or whatever, bullying is bullying. And uh, I think the law, uh, we, I sat through the committees on it. I, I went and I talked to the head author. Um, it went over to the Senate. It came back and it was in uh, a really nice form. Uh, I've gotten very, very little negative feedback from all the superintendents. And I have personally met with all the superintendents of my district. And there's like six or eight of them. And uh, I know them by name. I have their phones now. Um, if they have issues with it, they haven't, they haven't shared them with me. All right. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Okay, the next question comes from Scott Hall. All right. Um, what's your understanding of treaties with Indian nations, and how do they apply now to relations between the state of Minnesota and the Indian nations here? All right. Thanks, Scott. And that question goes to Mr. Erickson. Well, treaties by definition are law. And... Um, you can argue about the fine points, but that usually takes place in a, in a court. Um, in my dealings with uh, the Red Lake Band, they're very serious about their treaty rights. And, th and they should take it seriously because this is the law, this is the agreement they signed with the United States government. Uh, I know they would like much more nation-to-nation -nation contact because they are a sovereign nation. They would like to deal with the state of Minnesota. They would like to deal with the U.S. government. Um, and they take, their, they, they take their rights and responsibilities very seriously. Uh, thank you. All right. Thanks, Mr. Erickson. Mr. Hancock. Treaties are serious business. Certainly, I think both sides uh, need to adhere to their obligation and uh, adhere to the treaties. Certainly, there are areas where maybe renegotiations need to take place. Uh, situations have uh, developed and continued even in terms of fishing rights. Uh, you know, it's much easier to, uh, uh, to catch a lot of fish today than it was uh, 
50 years ago, 60 years ago. So maybe those, some of those things need to be negotiated. Uh, I think we need to abide by all our treaty rights. Uh, certainly the, the workings between uh, two independent nations and a state within a nation and a county within the state uh, and a legislative district within that pose some concerns <laughs> and some issues that, uh, uh, you know, maybe need to go into, into negotiations as well. For example, I think election laws should be the same. In, uh, in all state elections. I'm not so sure that I can have an observer on the Red Lake Nation. Uh, should that be uh, looked at? I asked Secretary of State uh, Ritchie to look into that and uh, that was four years ago and I've still not heard a response. Okay, thank you Mr. Hancock. Mr. Erickson, rebuttal. Well that would almost imply that there is something amiss up on the reservation which I see no evidence of um, the, the tribal IDs that they use up there are harder to get than uh, a, a regular Minnesota citizen's identification type of thing. Um, I, I'm almost offended by the statement that, you know, somebody needs to look over their shoulder up there to, to see, you know, whether, <laughs> whether the votes are being counted correctly. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Erickson. Mr. Hancock, any rebuttal? No, that was not the inference. I was just saying we were not allowed to even have a poll watcher up there to count the number of people that were balloting uh, to vote. Uh, certainly, uh, tribal identifications would have certainly fitted the definition for the voter ID. Uh, I still think that's a very good idea. Um, certainly, the uh, um, the citizenry obviously have a right to vote. I think it's important that we maintain the integrity of elections and that registrations are validated before votes are counted. All right, thank you, Mr. Hancock. Next question comes from Dennis Wyman. I'm going to work in a question from a viewer now. Uh, the question reads, what is your position on abortion and what kind of legislative action on this issue would you support or oppose? Okay, thank you, Dennis. And that question goes to Mr. Hancock. I believe that life begins at conception and ends at natural death. I signed on to uh, three anti-abortion bills when I was in the legislature. Two of them were passed, both vetoed by the governor. Uh, one pertained to uh, public funding for abortions, um, which I see my opponent actually uh, voted to continue that uh, through an amendment. I also voted uh, to limit abortions to time after a pain threshold, uh, approximately 20 weeks. Uh, that was approved and also vetoed. Uh, I did sp sponsor, although it was never heard, a uh, heartbeat bill. Uh, I think it's important. Uh, to me, uh, one of the guarantees in our Constitution as put forth by our Declaration of Independence is the right to life. Uh, to me, nothing is more important than that. And uh, again, uh, we need to help those making those decisions to make what I would say decisions that support life. But in the meantime, let's also work towards ending this uh, abortion travesty. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hancock. Mr. Erickson. Um, I am pro-choice. I've been that way my entire life. Um, I don't like abortion. I am never happier than when I have a baby sitting in my arms and, and uh, uh, anybody that knows me up in my church n will back that statement up. Uh, I just feel very, very uncomfortable as an old man sitting here making decisions that young women have to live with. Um, it's got to be one of the most difficult decisions that a woman can make. and. Uh, I, I had one person that I knocked on the door, well, they're just using it as birth control. No, they're not. I mean, that's just, that's just absurd. It's a very personal decision that should be made with a woman and her doctor. And I, I, I just feel that um, putting my nose into that business is just, it makes me just totally uncomfortable. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Yerkson. Mr. Hancock, any rebuttal? From what I understand, the majority of abortions, uh, the response given by the 
uh, women involved is not just didn't want it at this particular time. That's the number one reason. Uh, very seldom is less than 1% the reason for rape, incest, uh, or the life of the mother. Um, certainly, if we even eliminated uh, uh, those objections, uh, I think we could save a lot of human life. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hancock. Mr. Erickson, any rebuttal? It's just a very difficult personal decision, and I think it should be made by um, the person that's involved. Okay, thank you, Mr. Erickson. Our next question uh, is to Zach Kaiser. Thank you, Warren. Um, this is uh, in regards to domestic violence, which has been in the news a lot lately. Um, do you support a law the legislature passed uh, earlier this year that prohibits people subject to domestic violence restraining orders from possessing firearms? All right. Uh, thank you, Zach. And that question goes to Mr. Erickson. Um, I was very, very proud of Representative Dan Schoen, who sits right next to me on the House floor. We have two little chairs way in the back of the room. And he was able to take this domestic violence bill that involved guns and get it to a point where the National Rifle Association did not score the vote. And it turned out to be a domestic violence bill. It was not a gun bill. And do I support it? Absolutely, 100%. With stalking, with convict, you know, convicted of stalking or domestic violence, you turn your guns over to somebody else. Um, I've also talked to uh, a deputy sheriff, or a, no, it was a probation officer, and he said that it, the message is finally starting to get out to some of these abusers that, yes, indeed, if you are convicted of this, you will turn your guns over to um, to the appropriate authority. It doesn't have to be to the law enforcement. It can be to a, it can be to a friend. It can be to a relative. Um, but absolutely, totally support that bill. All right. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Mr. Hancock. I have not read the bill. To me, it would depend on, on what you mean by restraining orders. If, if the restraining order is a result of a conviction of domestic abuse, uh, then I think probably the, the law would be in effect. But if someone has not been convicted of a crime, um, then I think uh, the Constitution does not give leeway uh, to public officials to restrict gun ownership in that manner. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. Mr. Erickson, any rebuttal? Well, that is a good clarification. It, you, you are convicted. You are not just accused of this. You are convicted of this, whether it's stalking, whether it's uh, uh, physical abuse, um, that kind of stuff. So yeah, it is for convicted people. All right. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Mr. Hancock, any rebuttal? Um, much like we would do with uh, uh, other crimes. If, if the uh, sentence involving the restraining order, once that has been completed, then I think we should look at perhaps a reinstatement. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. Next question would be Scott Hall. All right, Warren. Right now, Minnesota depends on coal, oil, gas, and uranium from other states and nations for most of our energy. What's your vision for Minnesota's long-term energy needs? All right, thanks, Scott. And that question goes to Mr. Erickson. Okay. Um, I, think we need, I think we need the mix of all of them. I think our, our solar is only in its infancy. Um, I think that wind energy is, while has a place, is not the see all, be all, everything. Um, I think we're going to use the coal that's out in, in my neck of the woods. We're going to use the coal that's out in western North Dakota. Um, they've, they've come up with very efficient ways of, of burning it. Uh, the, the air standards in the counties that burn those are some of the cleanest air in the nation. Um, I believe that's going to be a base energy for us for many years to come. Um, can we get to the stage of where solar and wind are there? I don't think we're there yet. I, I think we're going to get there when the batteries improve enough where the energy generated on those individual sites can be stored and used on those sites. Um, I, I think when we get to that stage, electric cars are going to be uh, a better alternative. Um, I don't think anybody really has a great stomach for putting up more nuclear plants until we, get, until we take care of the disposal problem. Uh, where are we going to store the, the spent fuel? Um, 
natural gas, uh, it's a shame the way they're burning that stuff off in North Dakota. It'd be great if that could be um, channeled and, and, and used and put up. Uh, um, but I think, I think it's going to be a mix. I don't, I don't see us being energy independent anytime soon. All right, thank you, Mr. Erickson. Mr. Hancock. Being uh, energy independent will be just a matter of will. Uh, I think we need all forms of energy competing in the private sector on their own merit. I think we ought to cut all subsidies to wind, solar, bios, and even oil. Uh, let's let the private market determine what is best. Uh, we talk about renewable energy. There's a, there's a place for wind and solar, but it is in the private sector on a smaller basis. Coal is going to be the main uh, source for our electric energy. I think uh, natural gas will be the main source for our heating, and certainly oil is going to be the main source for transportation. Uh, to say they're non-renewable, um, it seems to me that uh, conservation means wise use of, if we have four to five centuries of oil, of coal, of natural gas available to us, certainly we ought to not be in fear of using that. We can do it efficiently. We burn coal cleaner than anyone else in the world. Uh, fracking has is, is allowed us to uh, be exposed to vast oil fields and we need to, this energy is the opportunity for us to get out of this massive national debt that we have. Let's uh, proceed uh, in due course. All right, thank you, Mr. Hancock. Mr. Erickson, a rebuttal? Um, one other issue that we need to deal with here is how we're going to get propane um, to northern Minnesota efficiently now that that pipeline that used to ship propane down this way is not there. I know there's been an awful lot of people working on storage facilities for that. Uh, uh, the Black Duck School put in a, a huge tank out there. Um, and, and many other places like that have begun storing it so that there's not this uh, crunch. Uh, the fall is looking like it's coming in wet and cold again. Um, the farmers are going to be using that propane to dry their stuff. Um, I, I, that's another issue that we need to deal with. All right. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Uh, Mr. Hancock, rebuttal? Um, again, the propane, if, if, if we could get the oil through the pipelines, we could free up the uh, rail cars to bring the propane. Uh, it's related. I, I think we do need to store it. I don't think the problem was uh, so much that we didn't have availability of it. It's just we couldn't get it here in time. Uh, and like I said, I would agree with Mr. Erickson in that sense. We did use a lot of it in the drying process. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. Next question, Dennis Wyman. What do you see as the greatest economic challenge facing your district today, and what can you do as a state legislator to address it? Okay, thank you, Dennis. And that question goes to Mr. Hancock. The biggest thing we can do to grow the economy, to me, we need three things. We need access to resources, we need access to long-term affordable energy, and we need to get government out of the regulatory process and leave more money in the hands of the entrepreneurs and the citizenry. Uh, we can do that. Uh, we certainly, uh, in access to resources, um, we need to rein in the EPA. If they ever get this uh, waters of the United States uh, through, um, and I understand that that vote won't be taken until after the elections, uh, that would raise pure havoc. It, it's almost laughable that we think that uh, a puddle in a guy's driveway could be declared a wetland, but that's a viable possibility. If indeed the Supreme Court of the United States could declare that what we are exhaling here this evening to be a carcinogen uh, and a uh, hazardous gas, uh, certainly nothing is impossible with the EPA. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. Mr. Erickson. A couple of things. If you're going to... Um, um, grow the base of your district, you really need to find workers um, that um, are skilled enough to go into the factories and, and use the jobs that we have. And one other, the really big problem that we're having, uh, it, especially in like Rosa World, Thief River, um, there are jobs there, but there's no housing for them. The, the available housing is, is like gone. And, and we need to get some kind of uh, uh, subsidy or something so that it's viable for businesses to start putting up these apartments so that these workers have a place to, to, to work. Uh, uh, Rosa is advertising on their both radio stations, um, 13 to $15 an hour starting 
starting wage and you no longer have to have a GED or a, a high school diploma. There's, there's jobs there, but we need places to put them and we need skills that, that they need to come in with. And, and you know, one of the skills is that you gotta show up for work every day and be willing to put in a good day's work and you, in many cases, you have to pass a drug test for these, for the CDL licenses and so on. There's jobs out there, but um, we need to get the people that want those jobs to the place where the jobs are and, and help them out, especially with housing starts to, to or, or housing for them to, to live in until they've been working three or four years and they, then they can maybe afford to go buy their own home. Okay, thank you, Mr. Erickson. Mr. Hancock, rebuttal? We talk about a skills gap, and I, and I understand that, but it bothers me when we say that uh, approximately 50, 53 percent of our college graduates are working at uh, jobs that are beneath their skill level. Uh, I would agree, there are jobs out there. Um, the, the training that we're getting, um, I think, begins down in our K-12 schools. We need, not everyone is going to college. We need to expose our young people uh, to the trades earlier on in junior high and high school and uh, give them the experience uh, hands-on uh, where we can instill in them the idea that uh, the trades still offer a tremendous opportunity for employment and advancement. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hancock. Mr. Erickson, rebuttal? Um, just a few things. Um, number one, the, the schools have been strapped for so much for so long a time, the only time people say, well, how's your school doing is when the results of the state test are published. And that's such a huge burden to put on them that to, to start focusing other people in other areas, um, very problematic. Um, do we have good um, shop classes and stuff like that going on? Yes. Um, I visited the Black Duck School and they build a, they build a house every year that, that's being sold. Uh, the high school principal bought the one uh, last year um, over in Laporte. They've got a wonderful program there. Um, the, the fish shack that uh, the BSU um, sells every year, they make. And they do, and about the only thing they buy is the tires. They, they, they bend the steel. They, um, they're using the computer drafting. They're using the um, robotics. They, I, mean, it's just, I mean, it's just a wonderful program. Um, so we are doing things out there like that. All right. Now, thank you, Mr. Erickson. And our last question for the night will come from um, a, from Scott. Okay, okay. Zach, do we? Or was it? No, I'm so. sorry. It's from, <laughs> so it's from Zach Kaiser. I, uh, I apologize. Uh, that's fine. Okay, um, continuing on the theme of uh, skills and labor, um, would you support a right to work law in Minnesota? All right, thank you, Zach. And that question goes to Mr. Erickson. No, no. Um, that's just a right to work for less. Um, I, 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 the states that have, that have enacted that, um, uh, don't really keep up uh, with with everybody. Um, we're doing just fine in the state of Minnesota. We certainly do not need that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Mr. Hancock. Yes, I was one of the uh, co-sponsors of the House bill that would give the Employee Freedom Act. You have the right to join a union. You have a right to collective bargain. You have the right to collect dues to do that. But be basically in your pursuit of happiness you have a right to say, no, I choose not to do that. Our studies would show that uh, among union people, the majority of them believe that you should not have to join a union and not have to pay uh, union dues. Uh, I think it's a matter of personal uh, right that you should be able to work in your profession without paying a third party for the privilege to do so. Um, and I think uh, right to work uh, states they are growing in terms of, that's where the young people are going. The increase in pay on those jobs is growing faster than in states that do not have the right to work. And the job growth themselves, uh, Texas being a number one uh, right to work state, that's where the jobs are. So I think if Minnesota wants to grow, certainly right to work uh, should be on the agenda. All right, thank you, Mr. Hancock. Uh, Mr. Erickson, rebuttal. Um, when I was teaching, we had some um, teachers that opted not to become members of Ed Minnesota. Uh, it was called fair share. They just took uh, part of what their, our dues were and the part that we used to, um, 
uh, bargain collectively for the contracts. They paid their fair share of that. Um, I, don't, I don't see there's much difference in the, in the other way the other unions work. All right. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Mr. Hancock, uh, any rebuttal? If you pay a fair share, you do not have a choice as to who does the bargaining for you. You do not have a choice as to whether you want to accept the bargain that's been made for you. You do not have a choice as to where your union dues are spent, both politically and otherwise. I don't think it's a fair share. I think you're really holding these people hostage. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hancock. And now we'll move to closing comments, and they are two minutes for each candidate. And we'll start with Mr. Hancock. I want to thank uh, KWE and Warren and the uh, questioners for uh, a spirited debate tonight. Uh, one issue that did not come up that I would like to take on, and that is uh, Minshear. Uh, to me, uh, I've been accused of uh, trying to privatize Medicare by resisting Minshear. And I'm, I'm guilty to the charge. I am on Medicare. To me, the greatest threat to Medicare is uh, the Minshear Obamacare itself. It's taking $716 billion out of Medicare to pay for Obamacare. Do the math, folks. Uh, you're going to have reduction in services, a uh, rationing of services, or an elimination of services. Minshear, Obamacare in Minnesota is simply not working. Uh, the deductibles are going up, the co-pays are going up, the cost of insurance is just astronomical. I have people saying that half of their pay is going for a $5,000 deductible plan. I even have one gal that says I have to have uh, insurance for my kids. Dental, $30 a piece, my kids are one and two and they won't see a dentist till they're three. Uh, we simply have to replace Minshear and Obamacare in Minnesota. And I will work for solutions that allow you to privatize your insurance, not ration them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. And now, Mr. Erickson, closing comments. Um, when I was running two years ago, I came across a couple of issues that were um, quite, quite major. And, and I don't bring them myself. I, I, bring these from people that I talked to. Uh, one of them was aquatic invasive species, and I met with a group in Hubbard County. Um, and we worked well. Um, we got some legislation passed. They wanted two things. They wanted a research center at the University of Minnesota, and they wanted some funding to help their local effort to solve the problem. We were able to do both of those things. Um, one other issue that came to my attention when I was running is the wetlands issue up in Lake of the Woods County. It's a huge issue. It's a serious issue. We finally, with my help and with my prodding and stuff, um, we finally got the, the Corps of Engineers, the Pollution Control Agency, the Bowser, and the DNR to sit down at the table and fix the problem. Now, I have a few more things that I have talked with people and gotten their issues and that I want to take down to the Capitol. Um, a few of them are uh, Lyme disease. That's an awful issue. It's a huge issue dyslexia screening for, um, for youngsters coming into school to find out if they have this problem to start with. Um, we need to rebuild Pine Island on Lake of the Woods. I mean, it took a huge beating this summer with the high water that we had. Um, Black Duck wants to stay with a four-day school week. I mean, that's an issue that I want to take down there and set up some framework so that they can do that. Um, I've talked with the loggers. They want money for reforestation, and they want money for roads that can e make them easier to access the logging. Um, and, and I have a bonding issue on Red Lake for their early childhood program that, that I want to continue down there. Um, so I've got a lot of things that I want to do, and uh, hopefully, with your help, uh, I'll be able to do it. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. And I'd like to take this time to thank uh, each of the candidates for participating in tonight's debate. Uh, remember, if you missed any portion of tonight's debate and would like to watch it again, it will be available on Lakeland Public Television website within 24 hours. Uh, that website is lptv.org. Also, a, uh, to read a recap of tonight's debate, you can pick up a copy of tomorrow's Bemidji Pioneer or log on to the Bemidji Pioneer website at bemidjipioneer.com. Please continue to watch all of our scheduled debate 
Coming up next at 8 p.m. is House 2B, uh, Mr. Steve Green, the Republican, and um, David Sobieski, the Democrat. Uh, good night and thanks for watching.